Julia just went over um, some of the presidents and at the top you can see two of them that um, kind of are inspirations for this hub concept. We're um, coining a playfully third space. Um, at the upper left, you can see um, this project called Win Winwood Walls. It's located in Miami. That is a mural project that really um, act, reactivated an area in Miami that had experienced decline over a number of years, and they've been able to um, rejuvenate that area and bring in a lot of investment and interest and recreate that um, district and neighborhood as a very thriving community. To the right of that image is um, Heights Mercantile, a local um, complex here in Houston that, as Juliet mentioned, utilizes a mix of um, existing infrastructure or, or old housing and a combination of new construction. So for this complex or this campus that um, was envisioned, the idea here was to potentially reuse some of the um, existing building types in, in the community and create a complex where we could do a play on uh, or reinterpretation of mom and pop shops where um, young entrepreneurs can run um, businesses on the front side and have a, a small studio, one unit um, bedrooms on the back side of the um, house and also um, utilize the facades of those units as murals, um, uh, canvases for murals where um, artists, and this is taking um, from the Project Row House existing model where they invite artists in for fellowships. Um, this, the community could utilize um, this park-like space to um, house a, a revolving art displays and bring people in and pull people into the community who would be investing in local entrepreneurs, which would tie into a lot of the feedback we got from the community, which included a return to commercial viability along Emancipation Avenue, increasing walkability, um, bringing in shops, cafe, food, and, and looking at um, help, um, uh, creating an idea about self-reliance within the third war community so that the community is able to invest in itself and, and um, circulate its dollars within. A look at the history and culture of the third ward, art, music, et cetera, are very important to the community. Um, um, one of the community members talked to us about um, garden to table concepts where community garden food are, re, or are utilized at um, local restaurants and um, just talk the idea about pocket parks and arts and culture. There was a mix of those kind of um, feedbacks from older community members, new community members. And we use those to think about like who this community would speak to also in the future. So um, here in this broad look, you can see we have um, a series of those mom and pop shops reinterpreted. Uh, reinterpreted with um, an art gallery concept across where um, potentially we could house uh, the artists who um, come and stay on the second floor of those units. And the bottom is an art gallery with community art and broaden art, et cetera. And along the back would be um, conceptual restaurants. So it's an idea where instead of the, the um, current trend with food halls and new um, um, chefs trying to make a name for themselves. Perhaps there's this idea where there are these um, restaurants that exist where um, up and coming um, chefs can lease out for X amount of time and build that clientele at this complex. There would also be um, open outdoor space, trails, et cetera, and an ability for food trucks to um, join in on the scene as well. So you can go to the next one, Juliet. Here's a closer up view where you can see um, internally, there's this in-between green space, which kind of plays on that in-between green space in, with um, located between um, row houses throughout the community already and in interstitial or interspatial space that allows um, communication and, and flow of traffic in between. So um, we, we just took this idea and just reinterpreted it a bit as making this kind of centralized spine that pulls you through the site. 
Here you can see some of those um, facades up front and, and close and see that those trails are um, kind of interweaving, pulling you to the exterior um, um, pathways and also winding you out and in, into the community and near the street edges. Here you can see on the shop side of those um, mom pop shop um, combos, uh, uh, the, the shops can be facing um, very active streets. They also have a, a place to kind of blend in with the residential um, boundaries that surround whatever site because this is really location independent. And it's really just a, a very um, um, simple way to honor the, the a type, an architectural type in the community that, that wasn't, for some, it's, it's a, a pleasing aesthetics for others. It's, it's a type of architecture that they didn't believe was, would have been the chosen type of architecture for Third Award if there was more influence over their history. But regardless of that, this, here's a moment to take that architecture type and use it kind of in a full circle way and pull in um, um, funding and also provide housing for those seeking to be um, um, young business owners or just start their own thing. So ideally these would be um, yoga, um, potentially um, holistic medicine shops, um, little cafes, they'd have um, um, uh, t-shirt makers, just any kind of businesses that are very true and unique to Third Ward and uh, allow them to have that kind of um, ability to, to have a, a sense of community and be in the community and, and um, thrive. Here you can kind of see an image of those um, farm to table concept restaurants, just a little in between space using all the, knowing and understanding um, the importance of porches and such with um, the row house type. The goal was to reuse that idea and kind of create spaces in between these buildings and around the site just to encourage um, interaction um, amongst the community and users. And last but not least, there, here's just a little closer look at those um, um, restaurant concepts, which we're calling third concept here, because it'll be really important to help brand the, or help the community find a brand or way to brand itself rather than outsiders coming in. So this is just hypothetical, but the goal would be for whatever comes into third ward, the community has a sense of ownership and they have a sense of um, um, an ability to control the narrative. So this is pretty much um, an idea for them to have something that's for them, but also welcomes an outsider so that they can have a, a taste of what um, Third Ward is and understand what it is beyond um, the, the, um, the current understandings they have of um, the community. So I think that's our last image, Juliet. Yes, it is. Well, and so now really we just, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for again for this opportunity. We'll welcome any questions or comments you might have. Thanks, Mel, and thanks everyone else. Thank you. Oh, this is Curtis Davis. I don't know if any of the other third ward um, residents are uh, are here or, or stakeholders. Um, I, I, so I'll just be brief. I, I think the, the images are very lyrical and, and they're very beautiful. I, I think the question of process becomes really key for the community. Um, the other issue about narrative, I, I think this question of control versus informing a narrative is a way of thinking about it. Um, oftentimes folk want to control things and don't have the tools and frustration gets going yet the ability to inform things and influence things are, 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 are more accessible. Um, and, but I think the, the lyricism and the poetics of this is, is, is wonderful. And I think the question of how to promote it to um, developers and uh, property owners, um, Midtown owns quite a bit of the land that you were looking at specifically. Um, one of the big parcels off of McGowan is already under development, but it might inform at a more subtle level on uh, what's going on. So those developers that through the uh, through Trinity um, East 
church should be advised of this. Um, but um, I, I, I thank you for the effort. I think it's uh, captures the spirit of the of the community in a really lyrical way. Thank you. Thank you. As always, I agree with everything Curtis said. Um, I, I also think that, uh, and unless you mentioned it and I, and I missed it, we should also look at how we're going to adapt and reuse and incorporate both the uh, corner stores that are still surviving as well as those that are abandoned. Um, I think that we can still do a lot with our existing um, active stock of corner stores to help them provide more fresh produce and deli options like they used to um, and help them adapt to the changing demographics uh, and density of the neighborhood, um, but also looking at the corner stores that have closed down um, but are still standing, how can we incentivize developers or community coalitions or opportunity zone folks to adapt and reuse those buildings um, to provide you know, community benefits again? Absolutely. We did look at, um, there's a, a, I believe a closed down corner store near Ralston's liquor store or something yeah. like that. Uh, there's actually two of them. Yes, yeah, so we were thinking about, um, and we didn't create renderings for them because of the time constraints, but we were thinking about a way to rejuvenate that little area and start, um, you know, um, maybe there's a, a, a new community commun uh, convenience store, that liquor store could be repurposed for something else, you know, like just start changing use a, a sample of the community to be the catalyst for the change that kind of pulls down emancipation, but start somewhere and just, you know, start weaving in these ideas, as Juliet said, uh, along the way. And it'll, I think it's, an, instead of thinking about how do we change this whole street all at once, it can start with the moment and then that can inspire the rest of how the community evolves over time. This is Antoine. I, I do want to commend the design team for coming up with a, a very sensitive, but yet still very adaptable and organic proposal that utilizes the row house aesthetic in a variety of ways. I think each one of the presentations really tried to listen to the community, but also leverage the embedded history of each one of those communities. And the images that Juliet and Melvaline presented really do that for uh, Third Ward. Anyone that's you know, spent any significant amount of time here knows that that particular aesthetic is really strong uh, and using a very iterative process can, can serve as that catalyst for more development, not only for residential applications, but also uh, for commercial ones as well. So I definitely wanna commend the group for basically kind of lighting a match for that catalyst opportunity. And so that part was really, really well done. Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you, Third Ward team. That was really a great presentation. They've all been really great so far. I'm really, really impressed and excited. Again, in the chat, there have been a few comments. So if you guys want to continue the conversation in there, feel free. It's open. Next up, we'll have our Sunnyside 2 team, the JC team. We'll do a presentation. Thank you for everyone who has stuck around and we will also have a recording of these presentations um, made available as well. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, we, I'm a part of the Sunnyside team, JC. Uh, it is comprised of Joaquin Vieira, Kimberly Phipps Nicole, David McLean, and myself, Ch Chavon Jennings. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us and just say thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. And we've really appreciated hearing from the community and um, taking on the role as uh, advocates for them. Uh, so when speaking with the residents, there were three main concerns that dominated the conversation, safety, food access, and also usable green spaces. People want to feel safe moving around the community while they are traveling on foot Residents expressed a need for uh, local fresh food. And they also um, not only want nice parks, they want green spaces that are thoughtfully designed and attractive. So after hearing this, our team looked at how projects already planned for Sunnyside could better address these needs. 
we noticed that a lot of the community concerns could be addressed by implementing uh, what we are calling a green network. So the green network is broken down into a few parts that would work together. The main components are public gardens that will both beautify and provide food, green corridors that provide residents with suitable pedestrian access to green spaces, and the final component being parks. The green network will impact um, the key concerns that we heard from the community. So things like lighting and wider walkways along corridors would allow people to feel more secure while traveling to schools and also to public spaces. Uh, so this network is something that can create a stronger sense of community pride. We envision events happening in a centralized area like Sunnyside Park that focuses on sharing food information and also uh, creating moments of fellowship. Uh, so uh, going forward, we didn't really want to uh, step on anyone's toes or create a conflict of ideas that are already circulating within the community. So uh, our team wants to build off of the existing elements within Sunnyside to turn this green network into a reality. Sunnyside already has community gardens. Uh, there are local farmers that are already working to expand the community's agricultural familiarity and also provide access to fresh food. Bringing more of that to places people visit regularly, like churches, parks, or even schools, would further that education and food access. We saw Sunnyside Park as a good location to capture all three elements of the Green Network, and uh, Joaquin will be getting into that next. Hi, so we decided to look at Sunnyside Park as our flagship project, not only because it's centralized within the Sunnyside community, but as Siobhan said, this is a, a neutral space where all kinds of residents can come to and meet. And it's also directly adjacent to the solar farm that the city is planning on building. And this is gonna be the largest urban solar farm in the US. So that puts the community of Sunnyside on a national platform. And we thought it would be best to focus our efforts on redeveloping the amenities that are provided at the Sunnyside Park and Community Center, since it's gonna be directly adjacent to this development. A couple of areas of opportunity that we saw that also kind of lined up in tandem with some of the comments that we received from the community members um, was sort of these, these patches of underutilized green space, uh, this large uh, retention space that's in the northeast corner of the park. That's again, it's just open green space that's not really used and a little awkward because of the elevation changes. There is also a, a centralized gathering space that's used for a lot of events. And we just wanted to kind of, kind of build on these existing amenities and revamp the uh, the park to serve as a centralized point to distribute information, to have uh, agricultural education occur. And we feel like this would create a strong foundation to address not only food security through a, uh, a network of agricultural practice, but also safer, more um, accessible green spaces for the community to interact with. One thing I think that was really unique about Sunnyside that I learned during our workshop was that there's some very strong community leaders in Sunnyside already that are agriculturalists and are tackling this issue of food security already. And that's something that we want to build off of because that's an existing effort that's happening. And uh, also build off of the effort that the com complete communities uh, City of Houston initiative is, is working on as well. They've outlined specifically that Sunnyside Park would be on their action plan. And so we wanted to tackle that as a part of our effort to help sort of define some design deliverables moving into the future. 
So how we reimagined Sunnyside Park with some uh, schematic reprogramming is again, we just wanna build off of what amenities are existing while also making the space safer and more appealing uh, adjacent to the, the solar farm development. So we started at the north side of the site by expanding the existing community garden and making it uh, fill up this entire northwest corner of the site, which will also be directly adjacent to the proposed community garden that would be in the solar farm just next door to the park. So this, uh, our thought was to kind of connect these green spaces at the top of the north side of the site and create a larger network of food accessibility, but also education opportunities, and, and really just to engage the community along the street edge with agriculture. We also then just mirrored across this parking lot, want to introduce a pollinator garden, which would attract beneficial insects to the area, such as butterflies and other pollinators, which would then lead into the community garden and other agricultural assets that we want to establish on the site. Now, something that I think is, you know, really big issue is flooding in the community. And a, a large piece of that puzzle, I believe, is uh, the landfill that's going to be converted into the solar farm. There's a lot of natural retention that's happening in this green space. So when we remove it, I think it's important that we address adding more retention space into the community to offset the amount of water that gets absorbed naturally in that space that we will no longer have. So we've decided to introduce constructed wetlands in the northeast corner of the park. A constructed wetland is essentially a layer of um, native plants and retention spaces that is designed specifically to retain a large amount of water naturally through biodiversity. Now, this space won't always have water. And so the thought is that as it's a constructed wetland, it's also providing nature trails and leisure trails to residents that can walk around and feel safely contained within the, uh, the park itself. It's also just at the corner of the site. So there's full visibility to the wetlands. And it also starts to create this a uh, very impactful visual narrative of this is an agricultural space, this is a biodiverse community, and this is a green network that we're establishing through major lines of transportation. One of the residents, she uh, mentioned that not only does she not feel safe visiting the green spaces in Sunnyside, but there are not any spaces to take her dogs. She travels outside of the community just to walk her dog in safe uh, circumstances. So we decided that here this space that was underutilized between these two parking lots on the east side of the park to create a small enclosed dog park where we could put something uh, as simple as a water feature, improved landscaping, and this again provides a safe enclosed space for residents to visit as an amenity and really build off of this interconnected system of activity, community engagement, safety. And uh, as we sort of move towards the south end of the site, there's a large, very, very long, narrow path here that leads to the uh, Johnson Neighborhood Library. Again, this runs along the, the edge of the proposed solar farm. And I think this is another great opportunity to introduce constructed wetlands and nature trails will, that will serve as a uh, retention barrier to the residential community that it's just next door to um, the solar farm. So this will create more leisure trails, but also very um, you know, in-depth system of retention spaces that will all be interconnected. Now, of course, to build off of uh, the feeling of safety, we'll be revamping or proposing a revamped lighting layout of the community, or at least along these areas that we're identifying as green corridors in this network. That includes improved street lighting and improved pedestrian lighting, such as bollards, um, landscape lights, so that um, 
residents in the evening or early in the morning can feel safe leaving their home and going for a leisure walk through the park. And um, again, we wanted to address the fact that a lot of people use this park. It's a multi-generational community that's from, from youth events to uh, elder residents. We wanted to improve the gathering spaces that are centralized in the middle of the park. So this can include art installations that engage local Sunnyside artists and um, just more engaging landscape design. If, again, this includes improved lighting for safety. Um, but our thought is that with this improved centralized gathering space, we can build on more program opportunities to bring educational resources and also just uh, communication, uh, grow, build upon communication. Because uh, one comment we got in the workshop that kind of echoed through several people was that they thought it was difficult to find a centralized location for information on what's going on in the community. So our thought in reprogramming the park is that this part can then become the foundation for some of that communication and education that's happening. Uh, it was also important for us to look at some of these major connectors in the neighborhood. We looked at Scott Street specifically, and this was just a quick collage of some of the sort of visual elements that you experience driving along Scott in Sunnyside specifically. You get a mix of single family and multifamily residential spaces, small businesses, a lot of houses of worship, and also some urban uh, farming and uh, other green resources like the bayou. It's important for this green network to function that these interconnected streets such as Scott Belfort and Reed, which were identified by the Complete Communities Initiative, that these function safely and can uh, allow residents to travel between these green um, assets in the community safely and comfortably. So this quick typology study was just to show some of the existing conditions. There's a median here in the center that expands in width as you move along Scott. There's a single, uh, sidewalk, pretty limited lighting, and um, there's also, you know, concerns for dumping in the area. And so our thought is by really paying attention to these major connectors and redeveloping them with new lighting, with retention strategies, and um, with more pedestrian friendly developments will create a sense of security in the community without having to police the community. And that's, I think, a, a huge topic that we want to sort of address through design. So as we move forward, as I said before, there's a, a strong network of community leaders in Sunnyside that are already tackling food security. They're not waiting for a big box retailer to come into the space and say, here is your food security. They're developing their own strategies independently. And we're hoping to uh, create the foundation for a larger network that's transparent and uh, constantly working between each other, sharing resources, information. And uh, I'll pass it over to Siobhan to kind of talk about what this development could look like. Yes, thank you. So we started looking at how the Green Network could be taken a step further to potentially bring money into the community through the expansion of local food production. So uh, the Great Basin Community Food Co-op is an example of a community that did just that. A group of Nevada residents made moves to meet the food accessibility needs of their community. They created a food co-op that partnered with local farmers that were already distributing food. And so um, this, this food co-op, it went from operating out of the back of a record store to a 525 square foot space and then to a 7,500 square foot building in the span of six years um, and through a lot of hard work and planning. 
So this is something that could potentially be um, in study side, local efforts that Joaquin has already mentioned um, are already in place, like through Ivy Leaf Farms, Fresh Life Organic, and also on a broader um, view of like Houston community fridges. Um, it shows that there are people that are wanting to, um, you know, put in action for something like this. And so going on, um, we just created a statement that kind of sums up our idea about in, um, our role and how design is going to be impacting. So it's change happens at the speed of trust. Sunnyside inhabitants long for assurance that product intentions are genuine and their unique needs are always considered. To this end, our design solution includes creating a sunny side specific modeling and analysis lens that ensures transparency and accountability process that maximize social, environmental, and financial benefits equitably. And so um, going on to like our final slide of like what happens now. So uh, we need to start spreading the word about things that are happening within the community and also things that are planned to happen um, from the city side as well. Um, and so maybe doing a, a kickoff event at the Sunnyside Park to get community input or further community input and uh, to tell people what is happening in their area is something that uh, would be awesome. And then going further on to gain momentum, partner with the community. And um, after these things are in place with the green network, um, not just leaving, not just leaving the community alone, just checking in and, and continually measuring the success of these designs and seeing what needs to be further developed. And then um, just continuing the path of nurturing the growth. And so that is all that we have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you all. If there's any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat or you know, we can address them directly in conversation. Uh, this is Curtis Davis. I put in the chat um, an example that you might take a look at or that the Complete Communities team could take a look at is McClendon Park in West Houston. It's a really good example of a park used for stormwater management. It's very, has a lot of different elements in it. And um, it's been in place for a while, for about um, eight years now. So technically the, the drawings are there. It tells a story about the history of the place on the walking paths. Um, and it would serve your park idea really well because it's a built example. And, um, you know, the question of funding and the sources of funding would be really, would re really be interesting. But I think it's a very vi viable idea that you got going um, and related to this. And you're absolutely right in assuming that the uh, solar farm would be a good catalyst and investing in that. Um, park and then letting that investment spur investment throughout the rest of the connected elements of the community. But I, I think you have a really strong proposal that ought to be followed up. Thank you for Thank that, you. Curtis. I, I would like to also add, um, as a, a team member on this group, uh, we had an awesome student in Siobhan. So those <laughs> other teams that we're talking about how awesome the students are, we were super excited. Um, to have a student on our team as well. And just really briefly in hearing some of the questions that came up um, throughout the conversations today and in the chat box, um, the, the Community Food Co-op project is, um, one of the reasons that it has been so successful is because it is community owned. It's community owned, it is community driven and community operated. And so by not waiting for the big grocers who we couldn't convince to come in, to come in um, and, and driving this from the community, um, it created so many other benefits that um, could potentially touch on 20 
of the points, at least within the complete communities action plan, whether it was related to how we could communicate with our elders who don't have internet access access and so it became a community hub for people to connect with um, but also just giving people access to more food it's one of the only food co-ops that um, got early approval to take snap and other grocery benefits and that was very empowering for the community to use it it also instead of being a new construction project built on empty land it intentionally, um, we took a blighted, vandalized old building and renovated it. And it had such a wonderful effect on the entire neighborhood relative to sense of ownership that we saw um, anecdotally uh, less complaints of crime in the area. And we saw more community investment in people wanting to keep it up and participate in its growth and success. And so it also has community art involved on it. So when we talk about all of these wonderful things that help the community feel like they're being seen and being heard, um, we, we didn't realize when we started to create it that it was going to check so many of those boxes and we were really grateful that it, it did so. And so we are super excited about the possibilities of tying the screen network together with things like community driven food spaces um, in, and look forward to collaborating with the Sunnyside neighborhood in the future as well. So thank you for your, for your time and all the input that you gave us in the community sessions, we're grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much to the team. We really appreciate all of your hard work and time. And I can assure you as a Sunnyside planner, that is not the last um, we will hear or see of that presentation. So we will move on to a -Leaf Westwood. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking with us till the end. Uh, we are a -Leaf Westwood, and we're just going to launch right into it. So go ahead. So first of all, we'd like to shout out to our wonderful community um, members who were in our workshop. Um, Trustee Natasha Butler, Dr. Kingsley of the EL Kingsley Foundation, Alice Lee of the Southwest Management District, and community member Jennifer Oslin. We really appreciate your feedback. And as you can see, we had a really exciting and informative community engagement workshop. Um, so the big takeaways that we pulled out of this was first of all, that the community members feel that this is a forgotten part of the city. It um, And there's three things that need to be done to really revitalize it. Namely, first of all, preventing human trafficking by engaging um, the local populations and specifically the youth in programming to inform and empower them. Second, to build a safer space for everyone and also uh, instigate social programs that can rebrand a leaf Westwood. And then third, engage the city in a larger conversation and solution to end human trafficking. Um, and the three themes that emerged from this were, first of all, starting with light and this idea of illuminating, providing safety, awareness, um, education, then access and connection. So, giving community members a way to get around other than driving, which is basically all that um, is easy to do there right now. And having uh, walkable streets, bike paths, um, and transit, potentially rapid transit was mentioned, um, as well as slowing cars down to make space for people instead of cars. Um, next, we talked about this idea of redeeming resources. So having a social services hub, like a community center, um, wellness center, we talked about women's center, um, and also bringing in local businesses to the area as well as supporting the ones that are already there, um, as well as expanding parks and green space for flooding and to help with, you know, connecting people to nature and biophilia. Um, and finally, having programming and activities that can engage everyone. And as I said before, especially youth um, and providing gathering space for anything from outdoor recreation, to outdoor theaters that can showcase creativity. So what we really gathered from this entire event um, was that it's not just these specific moments of intervention that are needed. We need really big moves as well. So, 
so during our site visit, we saw all of these challenges really firsthand. Human trafficking is omnipresent in the area and the streets are really dominated by cars that aren't really local traffic. It's all a lot of traffic that is really fast coming between the two highways. And it's pretty hostile to pedestrians and not walkable and feels really isolating. Um, it takes forever to cross the street. So our primary priority for this area is to first make it a safe space, make the BizNet corridor safe so that we can re-engage and activate the community. And so as we start to look at some of these um, ideas and how we can uh, give the citizens a tool that can be both a kind of protective edge as well as something that can be a sort of sharpened edge for how they begin to combat some of the illicit behavior that goes on within the neighborhood. You know, we really looked at light as kind of that big idea in order to be both sort of shed light on um, some of that illicit behavior, but also to give the citizens and business owners confidence that um, you know they're seen, they're heard, they can feel safe and protected um, within their own neighborhood. And so we look at um, you know ideas that go on both locally as in sort of temporary installations somewhat seasonal ideas, you know, looking at things that are uh, both nostalgic and then also kind of traveling things that, that come um, through many multi, uh, multicultural cities around the, the globe too. Um, and so as we sort of think about kind of that master plan, um, I think we want to go, yeah. Yeah, some of this is, yeah, we, we came with this idea of what we're calling the sort of A-leaf or Westwood A-leaf rainbow. And uh, that kind of is bookended by uh, the two major um, freeway systems along Bissonnette. And so we're thinking of this as a, a choreography of light along Bissonnette Street that's capable and provides a visual spectacle um, to illuminate uh, the neighborhood and its feelings of neglect. You know, that has the opportunity to offer that tangible protection for its citizens as well as the opportunity to generate some intrigue for the neighborhood and re-engage with broader portions of the city. Um, and from there, we're hoping that that sort of generates a civic skeleton that business owners and, and neighbors um, can rely on to then sort of further in uh, their own developments along Bissonnet Street and then in more tertiary moments within the neighborhood itself. So if we just kind of look at the master plan here for a few minutes, um, I think the idea here is that we, um, in talking with Natasha and uh, Dr. Kingsley, um, you know, there are obviously some some moments within the neighborhood that are doing, you know, really good things. And so we want to kind of provide an opportunity to kind of wrap our arms around um, those, uh, those elements and let them sort of have a chance to further expand into the neighborhood. Um, and then we also want to create other opportunities in some of the um, unclaimed spaces as we look at opportunities like uh, Arthur Story Park, which is just outside of this neighborhood and the Bayou, Tersh the Bayou Connection. Um, and how can we provide um, some opportunities to connect our neighborhood to the, the larger Greenbelt systems? Um, and I think as we go into some of our other slides um, and really look at uh, this and that street, I think the main important thing is not just how we invigorate that corridor itself, but how do we connect the north and south ends of that street? How do we provide a uh, pedestrian experience that makes that an easy traversal, easily traversable and um, you know readily pedestrian friendly environment? And then also how do those um, spurs then pull down into other elements like Forum Park, which is adjacent to the elementary school. Um, you know, there's the D spot there along Bissonnette Street. How does that potentially interact with um, some unclaimed space, both to the south and the north, as we look for a recreational or sort of festival environments? You know, how can the, how can what's, you know, doing good in the neighborhood, how can that expand its mission into broader moments within the, the city? So we, we looked at the D spot, which was the focus. Uh, and this is a great place to do community outreach. I feel like if we open up this, this space to a public plaza, it would really connect to the community and provide opportunity. Um, also, uh, 
you know, just providing opportunities for creativity along this area as well. So if we open up that space, it can really um, allow businesses, the community, and um, even uh, government to uh, activate and to connect with the community here. And also this allows uh, a path to the urban, uh, to the park space that we're proposing as well, as well as uh, uh, development opportunities on that parking lot across the street. Uh, this is where uh, most of the human trafficking we felt was happening along Center Parkway. And we felt like this, this it used to be a place where it, it felt like, yeah, it, it could be something bigger that, that it was, but it didn't happen. So to, um, so we could definitely uh, revitalize this, this intersection by, uh, yeah, just creating interest and in walkability and protect the pedestrian, uh, bike paths, um, a light canopy, ideas like that can really uh, impact the, uh, the flow of traffic and, and the human trafficking events that are happening here. And this is uh, what we propose for Forum Park. Uh, and to connect to the, the Forum Park to Bissonetta uh, again, because it's isolated behind uh, all these buildings. Uh, and to provide a civic space of play and fun and sports for, for the people and community here. Uh, and also a way to connect to the other parts of the program as well. And also just to give, uh, uh, make people proud of this space again, you know, be proud of what they have in this space. And so from Forum Park, we can connect using these, these striping uh, uh, opportunities to the space behind the D-spot and having amphitheater and engaging the, the empty parking lots that are already there. Uh, and also opportunity to connect with um, Metro who, who parks and uh, park and ride is happening right here as well. And of course, uh, I, I know Dr. Kingsley said they, they were really successful with their um, outdoor theater events. You know, many businesses happen to, you know, take part in it. So definitely is a, this is an opportunity to happen here as well. So another thing that arose out of our discussion was this idea of multi-positive spaces as a way to work together to overcome the negativity of poverty and crime in the area. Um, and during our workshop, we really honed in on this um, precedent in the other side of the corridor where they start they installed an HEB and now it has become an anchor that has helped them begin to revitalize the community on that side of the highway. Um, so rather than subscribing something that we wanted specifically, we've decided to make this plug-in opportunity for a grocery store and food court that would offer access to fresh food that, re that really reflects the unique culture of the community and also showcase all the different and many cuisines of the area. And we also wanted to provide a social service too, through having community programming. So anything could happen there, such as you know chef classes, but even something as big as like a big food truck festival. Um, and so we really wanted to engage with many different things here by having that anchor. And next we have the Braze Bayou Trail. So there are two trails of bike paths that do not connect right now from Art Story Park along the bayou, and then it goes down to Braze Bayou. And we want them to connect and come to Ailey's to bring Ailey's the bike path that connects them to the rest of the city. And in addition to that, we're adding another path that comes down to our site and to our big corridor here so that we can have a hub. And again, we have those other bike, bike paths on the uh, road itself, but we felt it was really important to have a walkable as well as a bikeable way to access the community corridor. And so we could connect all the housing 
to all of the community resources in other ways, um, especially since um, the community workshop really illuminated that the most common means of transit was really walking. Um, we were also looking at uh, how to have more light and less parking to create more safe spaces for locals and you know, promoting people and not cars and helping with trafficking in that way. And by expanding green space, by having this wild park alongside it, um, we thought about how over time it could grow and become and take more over from these other types of places there. And in the end, it would really help reduce flooding, but it would also provide that really vital basic human need for a connection to nature and um, also spaces for outdoor recreation and promoting wellness through programming like having a boathouse or something along those lines that they could have um, that would provide a community resource so people could um, engage in outdoor recreation and even more foster leadership, character and confidence through those programs. Next slide. There we go. And so as we kind of go and sort of pull back and think about you know how we begin to look at this area, I think the the fact that it is bordered by um, both freeways, um, you know, that quarter along Bisnet currently um, is a very trans or uh, it, it encourages transient um, populations to come to it and, and egress very quickly. Um, and so I think the opportunity there is to kind of claim those underpass elements as kind of signage and, and, and gateway moments. Um, that sort of suggests that uh, this neighborhood, um, you know, no longer is interested in sort of serving that kind of population, but it's also interested in, in going from this net being a kind of placeless environment between two things, between both uh, freeways, to really becoming an iconic sort of um, moment within the city of Houston that has its own, that can even kind of grow that, that, that nature of, of what these colored lanterns throughout this neighborhood might be in kind of a, a global context that people might know that coming along this and that is one of those sort of very intriguing moments um, that is unique. Um, so I think that's kind of, uh, I mean, this would, that would be one of the opportunities. And then uh, looking at the Southwest Freeway and, and, you know, again, just instigating those lanterns as kind of a um, a claim space is sort of a threshold moment of knowing um, that you're entering something and that it, uh, and that there is a kind of visual spectacle and a choreography of light um, along this portion of Bissonnette Street. So a quick timeline, you know, it could be many possibilities if we just start with a crosswalk uh, as, you know, to re revitalize Bissonnette and then end with the Buffalo Park development. And that's really up to the community. And, you know, this is just one possibility of a timeline. So we want to thank you and, and we're happy to ha answer any questions. Natasha can go ahead. I see, yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, so let me just say that um, I love the light concept, right? Because too much activity is happening in the dark. Um, so I love the fact that y'all were talking about it from, from all about the illumination, whether that be lanterns or grass or bright, bold colors, that it wasn't um, just standard like building, that you really thought about um, how we felt about our community and what we wanted to see in, in the color scheme. Right, um, I really loved the concept of connecting the bayous. Um, that's something that I didn't really think about. And I think that you guys brought up a valid point because you know the Westwood side in theory could walk to the Arthur Story Park if we connected those pieces. So I really loved, loved that concept. Um, I love the fact that y'all took some of that Discovery Green feel and brought it to our community. Um, as someone who goes to Discovery Green every week, <laughs> Um, I, I live there, um, right? Um, and I take my kids there and they're always like, mommy, how come we don't have this in our community? So um, I think that's important. Um, but I also love the fact that you did a lot of that green space, that open space, that connectivity 
those walkable sidewalks that have striping and pavement so it doesn't look like just plain ones. Um, and so I'm just really impressed with the, the, the theme of the illumination being the backdrop by which you're talking about connecting these pieces and helpfully going and reducing crime in that same space. So um, I love the open concept. I like that it's not closed off, but I like the fact that y'all took into account all the different pieces that we have in the community, but really creating a hub, a walkable area, right? But that opening it up in the sense of that, um, you know, that we're a part of something that's larger, right? That that bisonette hub is actually connected to freeways and it kind of lives in its own little square piece, but actually saying like, yeah, this is y'all's neighborhood, but that you can connect it to, to the other neighborhoods just as well. So thank you so much for your hard work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha. I think you have a uh, Randall with his hand raised. Okay. Yes, I, I love this. I used to live in Briar Grove Park um, and the community, you know, there's so much of that community that's wonderful and so much of it that needs that needs advocating for. Uh, also though, I, I, the, uh, the area at Taft and Westheimer has the rainbow crosswalk. There's been recent talk that the MUTCD does not allow for the, for the crosswalk to be rainbow or for other artwork uh, on the streets that there's a lot of, a lot of differentiation of uh, traffic control and artwork problems. I don't think those are not, I, I think those are overcomable obstacles that, uh, that the federal government may be putting on some of us. And I just love that we have all these uh, designers in here looking at it and proposing colorful crosswalks and colorful streets and and myself I would love to see 4D renderings on the streets but uh, but we're going to have to overcome that with some design elements that uh, make the federal government allow us to do that so thank you thank you thank you Alrighty. Thank you all so very much. Thank you to all of the design teams and to everyone who has stuck with us today. Um, again, these conversations will continue, hopefully with our design teams and our neighborhood our support course. teams and our planners. So I am going to pass it over to Krista and Jennifer, if we could share the last slides. Wow, <laughs> I just I just need to start there because I am just so um, overwhelmingly pleasantly pleased with just everything that I've seen and just so appreciative. I, I keep hearing everyone say thank you and I just can't say it enough. I honestly feel like that's not even impactful and strong enough statement to, to really um, reflect on on how I feel in this moment um, um, with all of you so I just can't thank you enough in terms of the design teams and the communities um, AIA, HNOMA, everyone who is involved in the team um, and I know you've all been waiting on uh, next steps um, and, and I've really just been um, absorbing all these wonderful recommendations and, and to be just quite honest in terms of the next steps um, is, is to make these come to life. I, I'm so appreciative of all these um, strategies and, and well thought out recommendations on, on how we can move forward. Um, I, I really can tell that each design team truly put in the time and, and the research and the conversations and, and connected with the character and the um, identity of the community, because I saw the reflections in, in every single one. And those are the things that you just can't Google. You, re you really have to um, truly empathize and, and understand what, it's, what these communities' um, identities are all about. And I, I saw it on paper and it was just um, so exciting and overwhelming and touching. So I can't thank you enough. Um, in terms of the next steps, 
Um, us in terms of the city of Houston need to digest all of this um, internally. We need to, I think some of it is a combination of pulling in um, some of the departments, right? Parks department, public works, um, but really, when, when we're talking about the complete communities team, it, it really is all of us working together because we need the residents there right there with us, right? This is ultimately community development, but if the community is not involved, then all this is for naught, right? So really in terms of next steps, what we wanna do is we wanna go through um, each of the recommendations from the respective complete communities. And we wanna continue the conversation um, with the lead planners um, and the neighborhood support teams. Just ultimately, we're gonna start, well, well, not start, but we've had meetings already underway where we're talking about how do we move implementation forward, but it was a little challenging because we didn't have some of the visuals on what is a town center or, or how do we um, help to connect uh, the gardens from uh, Cashmere Gardens and, and all these wonderful um, strategies that were written in the action plans, well, excuse me, the projects in the action plans, but we didn't all the way have a clear roadmap on how to get there. So this is, um, I, I think, so amazing to see that these visions that were written and captured and prioritized by the community, now we have a visual to go with it. And, and now it's um, an easier conversation when we do talk to corporate donors and, and, and different um, partners, such as a potential grocery store, and what are we truly trying to accomplish um, when we say that we're working with communities to revitalize them. So um, absolutely heard you when, when um, the different community members and, and teams were saying um, that we should use this. Absolutely. That, that was part of the intent of us even initiating this. Um, but I will also give a disclaimer that we cannot provide the slides out. Um, that was one of the agreements that we made when we first um, talked about this concept, um, but we are sharing the concepts and we're gonna incorporate them into our meetings, but I cannot just email these slides out for the protection of the intellectual property of our design teams who have volunteered their time. But I'm really looking forward to the continued conversations. Um, I advise each and every one of you to sign up for the Complete Communities newsletter if you have not done so already. Um, absolutely, that is uh, one of the key methods in staying in touch to know when are these community meetings, when will, you know, if, if the pop up, for example, is something that um, we help to facilitate with the community leaders and organizations in the communities, then absolutely those are the types of things that we put in the newsletter to help advertise and share out um, to the broader community. But ultimately we still need the community there with us to help share it out, to help tell us, you know, if the vendor fee was too high, to help clarify um, some of the recommendations and, and some of the critiques that you've had as well. So um, I, once again, can't thank you enough, especially um, considering we are two and a half hours over <laughs> the initial allotted time. I know that that is um, definitely uh, a little bit more than, than what we initially um, asked for you um, in terms of your time, but these conversations were too important to, to cut short. And I'm just so grateful that each and one of you um, are here with us um, as we, talk about and not just talk about, but make happen um, these different recommendations and strategies. So um, those are my um, concluding comments. I really wish we had a little bit more time just because I would love to hear some feedback from the teams on how is this experience for them. But I think we have to probably table that for another day. Um, uh, so once again, please sign up for the newsletter if you haven't done so already. If there's any community members that would like to share some additional comments um, or um, you know, feedback about the different strategies, or if there was something that was presented that you would like to be a part of um, when it comes to implementation, then please communicate that to the lead planner. Um, we're gonna send out um, the information via email in terms of the newsletter sign up, but it is also in the chat as well. We will also um, send an email out about the, the different lead planners for the respective complete communities areas in the case that 
um, you were not um, aware of who that was is, as well. Um, but that's the conclusion of, of our Designing for Impact series. Uh, it's a little bittersweet because this is something that, you know, we talked about as just an idea and, and kind of pitched it to Council Member Robinson to pick his brain and um, I definitely. You. Hey, Krista, can you give me just one second? Because Yes, go no, please. I was just thinking about that same pitch you gave me, and there's so many aspects of today's discussion that are worthwhile. And uh, my thanks to you and your team, to, uh, to Director Wallace Brown, to Director Bugs, uh, to the city staff, and of course, to all the communities working together. This is outrageously cool, and so so many great ideas. The comments out loud from those who are chiming in, as well as in the chat room. These are all really, really helpful for the reasons you've stated to visualize the things that can happen um, <clears throat> to the list of folks that I hope you're planning to, to share this with. I hope you'll include all of my colleagues who are the district council members. And now we've obviously got to get the mayor to see all this great work. It, it, it is it will become a wonderful repository. And for all those um, who've wondered how these things can become reality, let's remember that my district council member colleagues have discretionary funding that can seed money. Um, and, uh, you know, my thanks to great leadership like Trustee Butler, who was here through the whole thing. Um, and uh, what a great way to spend a beautiful day. And um, Lindsay, I think at the beginning you were telling us that we were, we needed to get out in the in the beautiful sunshine, right? Yes. Now now's the time to get out. We were trying to wait till the sun got in the perfect position. So uh -huh. it was part of the strategy, you guys. <laughs> Great job, you guys. No, can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, Councilor Robinson. That's a conclusion of, of my speech and, and my soapbox. I just I just can't thank y'all enough. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you all. We look forward to continuing this conversation. And thank you for your time and effort put into these complete communities.